Hi hey folks, this is Krista Soria. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about linear and logistic regressions. A logistic regression on face value is just like a correlation. We're examining the, or we're actually predicting the value of a dependent variable on the basis of an independent variable. Multiple linear regression does the same thing, but it predicts the values of a dependent variable on the basis of several independent variables. I like to talk about it like correlations in the presence of other correlations. So regression lines essentially reflect our best guess as to what the score on the Y or dependent variable is predicted to be based on the score on the X variable. It's a little bit like the old Y equals MX plus B equation that you might remember from uh, middle school or high school math classes where we're able to predict the slope of a line based on some of the data that we have in this equation. Regressions line work, regression lines work the same way, except for instead of the m uh, variable that helps us to predict the slope, we get a beta variable, or b. Um, when we think about, um, I'm just going to skip by some of this stuff, when we think about a multiple regression, what we're looking at is essentially predicting the basis of y, which is our dependent variable, by adding up or summing all of the relationships between our beta coefficients, which are also called regression weights. They're like little correlations in the presence of other cor correlations, so they're partialed out correlations, times the value of our independent variable. So that could be an ACT score or GPA, or it could be whether a student is male, female, or transgender. Um, but we add those up and then we're able to essentially predict our dependent line. Um, the coefficients are what we pay attention to most readily. In a traditional linear regression or a correlation, you could see it sort of looks like this. And again, our idea is to best predict that line uh, based on all the data that we have. With a multiple linear regression, it gets a little bit more complicated. So in a standard correlation or regression, um, we have uh, album sales. Um, uh, we're predicting the al album sales here in thousands by the thousands of dollars that we spend on our advertising budgets. But in multiple linear regressions, it gets multidimensional because we're predicting album sales, but we're also considering the number of plays on the radio per week or and the advertising budget. So we're examining the different levels of effects or relationships on, from these two variables on this variable. We're a little concerned in uh, regressions with measuring uh, our residuals or the goodness of fit for a particular variable. Residuals might ring a bell because they came back from our ANOVA test. And again, residuals are those extra values, right? So when we have a regression line, what are all those error terms, those extra values um, based on uh, the individual observations, um, their distance to that regression line? And OLS regression works the same way. We're just summing the squares of those different residuals. And it looks like this as well. So there's kind of a, a, an equation to get to how we develop our R squared value. Um, but effectually, we're summing up all those squares um, and uh, of the residual values. There's four assumptions behind regression that are really important to note. Um, one is related to multicollinearity, so our individual independent predictors could not be too highly correlated. An example of that might be um, if we're including a measure of an individual's height in feet right alongside of an individual's height in inches. Those are essentially one and the same thing, right? A six foot tall person is 72 inches and that will never change. Um, and so that's going to be almost like a perfect correlation if we have 200 individuals in there. So that might be highly correlated and that becomes problematic. Another assumption is related to homoscedasticity. Another is independent errors and then normally distributed errors. Um, so uh, I will show you some of these as they look in a uh, regression and then how to actually test for those as well. Um, so there's a couple of steps that you can take and I have them a little bit further um, in our uh, data set, including some of the plots um, here in our PowerPoint presentation that you could look at for what sort of looks good or what doesn't look good in terms of uh, you know, potential outputs um, with our regressions as we're testing our analyses. So let's go ahead and just uh, jump right into uh, conducting a regression analysis. And as we do that, 
we'll test for those assumptions. So under Analyze and Regression, we're going to choose Linear Regression. And what I'm going to do here is just predict GPA, uh, so that's our dependent variable, by a variety of other factors that I have here in my data. So first I want to share that um, you can enter in as many variables as you like, um, but when it comes to demographic variables, those need to be dummy coded. So in other words, with first gen, I have zero is not first gen, one is first gen. Greek students is zero. Uh, is one, uh, non-Greek is zero, um, and same with the residence hall. You lived in a residence hall one, you didn't, that's a zero. If you want to enter in a variable like race and ethnicity, you need to do what's called dummy coding. Um, so right now our race ethnicity is like one American Indian, two Asian, three black, four Hispanic, and um, SPSS will just read those like a scale of one to six, like strongly disagree to strongly agree, and that's not what we want it to do. When you are dummy coding your variables, you need to have a constant referent or a constant zero. So um, for instance, I've gone ahead and dummy coded just a couple of those uh, race ethnicity variables just so we could sort of see what they look like. Uh, but the common referent for those is zero, and I could do that for all the racial categories. And again, the common referent would have to be a zero, so I would not code my white students. My white students would always be zero if I wanted to look at my students of color. Under statistics, I usually like to select Durbin-Watson, uh, descriptives, and then collinearity diagnostics. Under plots, what I do is I move the predicted residuals, that's the Z pred, that's the Y, over the Z resid, that's our residuals. And then I select histogram and normal probability plot. Um, everything else is pretty okay. You don't need to save anything extra. Um, uh, nothing for style, nothing for options. You can go ahead and click OK. When we get a regression equation output, we get a lot of information. First, our descriptive statistics table tells us the mean and standard deviation for all the variables that ended up in our analysis. And it's important to note that um, not all of our students showed up here. In a regression analysis, we're only looking at the students who answered all of the items <laughs> that we've included in our regression. So if a student did not answer this item, I really enjoy being a student here, they would get kicked out of the analysis because we don't have a score for them. So we can't use them in our regression equation. And you know, going back to it, right, it's all one big equation. Um, and it looks, uh, I'm just trying to find it in my PowerPoint, it looks a little bit, uh, I passed by it. Um, trying to find my regression equation there. It looks like this at the top. Uh, so if, if somebody didn't answer something, they're not going to be included, so they'll be kicked out. The second thing that we can see is a list of correlations, and that's a way of kind of examining where we might encounter some potential multicollinearity. Um, so I, right away I notice, wow, I feel like I belong here and I really enjoy being a student here, do have a high correlation. There's an additional test for multicollinearity that will test a tolerance test. So we'll see if that's going to be problematic for us. Under model summary, we get our R squared value. That's the percentage of variance in our dependent variable, which is GPA, that we can uh, attribute or explain by the variables that we entered in our model. So in our model, the variables that we entered explain 8.6% of the variance in students' GPA. Uh, finally, I like to look at my coefficients tables, and this is sort of the output that really matters. So we see a couple of different pieces of information here. First, we get our, our unstandardized betas, and the way that we interpret that is uh, if a variable is significant, like this one here, other people would say, I'm a hard worker, that variable was significant. The way that we interpret that is for every one unit standard, I'm sorry, for every one unit increase in students saying other people would say I'm a hard worker, a one unit increase would be moving from say agree to strongly agree, we would expect to see a 1.33 increase in students GPA. So for every additional point of agreement here, to other people would say I'm a hard worker, we're going to see kind of a big difference in students' GPAs. Um, 
As we scroll over, we also see the standardized coefficients, which are typically what we also interpret in our reports. Um, that's a great sort of measure of like a relationship in the presence of other relationships. And we think about it sometimes as a regression weight, so we can compare how important this variable is to the other variables as well. And um, with the standardized coefficient, again, we're curious about that uh, significance value. We want P is less than 0.05. Um, as we continue along, we need to look for our tolerance values and our VIFs, our variance inflation factors. These also help us to see whether or not um, we are encountering uh, violations to our assumptions of multicollinearity. We're looking for numbers less than 10, so we're golden. No multicollinearity from what we can tell. Um, other significant variables in the mix, first of all, for first gen, what we see here is a negative relationship. We also see that for Greek students as well. Um, so that negative relationship means that first generation students have a significantly lower GPA compared to non-first gen students. And Greek students also have a significantly lower GPA compared to non-Greek students. And we know it's lower because of the negative sign here on the unstandardized coefficients or on the standardized coefficients. Um, and then we know that these variables are significant because the p-values are less than 0.05. Um, some additional statistics that I pulled, the Durbin-Watson, um, we'd like that to approach 2. Um, over 2 becomes problematic, but we should be pretty okay um, with the 1.833. We're just not explaining a lot of variance um, as denoted by the R squared. So we have like 92% of students GPA that we don't know <laughs> because we, d we don't have really good predictors um, in our model. Uh, scrolling down just a little bit, um, here's a histogram of our residuals. And what we're looking for is something that approximate a normal, it approximates a normal distribution. Uh, let me just kind of show you what's bad. Um, it's pretty bad if it looks like this, right? We have a bimodal distribution here with a set of data over here and some over here. That would be bad. That's not good. What we have is pretty good, so not bad. We're also looking at our residuals here um, a, a, on a what's called a PP plot. And uh, this also looks pretty okay. What we want um, is something that's like a little bit closer to the line, like this is really good, much better than, oof, that's bad, this is also pretty bad, right? So this is not what we want in our regression output, but we got something closer to this, so that's great, um, not bad. And then finally, we're looking at our scatter plot of our residuals. We want this to look like buckshot on a road sign, just random gunshot scattered. Um, and this is pretty okay. Um, it's really bad, though, if you get something like this. This is not good for scatter plot output. This is bad. Um, so it seems that we're doing pretty okay. Um, this is also really good, kind of also what we'd like to see. So um, not bad in terms of, um, you know, how we're kind of meeting some of those assumptions of our of our regression analysis. So these help us to measure the, our, going back to our assumptions, um, we discussed very briefly the multicollinearity, the independence of error terms, uh, here we go, the uh, norm, normally distributed errors, that's our histogram, um, and then homoscedasticity, and so that also, this is uh, that last scatter plot that we saw. Um, independent errors is measured by Durbin Watson. Normally distributed errors is measured by that histogram. So we're, we've kind of met those assumptions. We haven't violated any egregiously, that's for sure. Finally, um, I'd like to very quickly talk about uh, logistic regression. So it's sort of like a chi-square in that we've got a dependent variable that's like a category. So you were retained or you weren't retained. You graduated, you didn't graduate. Or you graduated, you withdrew, or you're still enrolled eight years later. Um, so our goal is to predict an outcome that's categorical. What we're predicting is the probability of an outcome occurring. Um, a lot of the statistics that we get 
in our logistic regression are similar to that that we get in a traditional linear regression, um, but there are some differences. Um, and what we're looking for is the table labeled variables in the equation. So under Analyze, we're going to click on Regression. And down here in the middle is Binary Logistic. And I'm going to predict students' retention. And I just pulled over a couple of random variables just so we could take a look at it. And let's also include students' GPA, because I know that that's going to matter quite a bit. Um, under Save, click on Probability and then Group Measurement. Under Options, click on the Hosmer Lemma Show Goodness of Fit. Um, that's a great way to help us see whether or not um, our, our model is actually a good fit. And then we're going to click OK. So as I mentioned, we're going to kind of scroll down to variables in the equation. And this is where we're going to see whether our variables are significant or not. And the way that we interpret this is for a one unit increase in our independent variable like GPA, we're going to see an odds increase in our exponentiated beta. So on this slide here, I've got like the odds ratio. It's the change in odds resulting from a unit change in the predictor. Um, so in other words, every time a student's GPA moves one unit, that means from a 2.0 to 3.0 or 2.5 to 3.5. That's a significant increase, right? But a one unit increase in GPA is associated with increased odds. Um, in other words, students are four and a half times more likely to be retained from year one to year two for every one unit increase that their GPA increases, which is um, awesome. Now, this is a big predictor. And I can tell it's a big predictor because of that exponentiated beta value. If I were to take out uh, GPA, some of these other predictors might show up as positive. And they do if we go down to variables in the equation. Suddenly, living in the residence hall is positively associated with retention. Students who lived in the residence halls were over twice as likely to be retained from their first year to their second year. Students' sense of belonging is positively associated with retention, and so is other people would say, I'm a hard worker. So these other variables became significant, and that's because we took out GPA, which is a very powerful predictor of uh, students' retention. I have a few more slides that you can take a look at. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention is that you can also report the Nagel-Kirke and Cox and Snell pseudo R-squared values. And if you scroll up just a little bit under Model Summary, um, here they are. And that's a pseudo R squared. They're not like a true R squared, but they're pseudo R squared. So that tells us approximately how much variance we can uh, predict in our dependent variable based on um, the, the variables that we have in the model. As you can see, it increased when we included GPA. Because like I said, it's a very powerful predictor of retention. It's very strong correlation with retention. Um, so with Cox and Snell, that was 0.065. Nago Kirky, 22.6. 22.6. And then if we scroll down uh, to the new model where we took out GPA, that dropped to 0.026 and 0.091. So you can see GPA really matters <laughs> in, in measuring um, and in predicting student outcomes. Um, so I hope that helps to provide a very brief overview of both linear and logistic regressions. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much.